USCSB React. That's right, we are so back, y'all. With, with another Spammy Warrior video where I'm attempting to make a video every single day. Spammy Warrior is almost over, and I'm gonna be honest, kind of, kind of ready for it to be over. Making a video every single day is hard. This video comes from the subreddit. It's titled USCSB Filling Blind. If you have a video that you want me to react to, let me know. Let's get started. October 23rd, 2009. A massive explosion rocked the Caribbean Petroleum Terminal Facility near San Juan, Puerto Rico. Gasoline overflow. Okay, so before we even get into what happened, we need to address that this is in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is not a state. It is a territory. However, Puerto Rico does have federal district courts, just like states with federally appointed judges who have lifelong tenure. A partner at one of my law firms is actually from Puerto Rico and is licensed in Puerto Rico. I had a matter that we were thinking about filing in Puerto Rico for a while, so we went down that rabbit hole on what it looks like. There are some differences. We're not going to get into it because it's probably totally irrelevant to today's video. You should just know that that is noteworthy, that it's in Puerto Rico. ...and sprayed out from a large above-ground storage tank, forming a huge vapor cloud which ignited. The explosion damaged nearby homes and businesses. Petroleum leaked into the surrounding soil, waterways, and wetlands. Fires burned for more than two days, destroying 17 of the facility's 48 storage tanks. The CSB found that current EPA and OSHA regulations are inadequate to control the hazards from facilities like Caribbean Petroleum that store large quantities of gasoline and other flammables. As a result, the company was not required to conduct a risk assessment of the danger to the nearby community from its operations, and the company did not have to implement safeguards that could have prevented the explosion. Okay, so just because you weren't required to do something doesn't mean you can't be held responsible. I'm making an assumption that um, this company might come out and say, hey, there was no OSHA regulation. There was no EPA regulation that we broke. So what? So what? You were still negligent. You still have an obligation to, to create a safe environment, to have a safe premises, to have trained people to, to, to operate safely. You don't need everything enumerated for you. I don't take sponsors. The only thing I ask is that if you need a lawyer, contact my team for a free consultation. While most people know me as a catastrophic personal injury lawyer, I'm actually a partner at two law firms that handle way more than just catastrophic injury. If you were the victim of securities fraud, received a notification that your info was included in a data breach, developed cancer as a result of a bad drug or toxic exposure, and many other situations, we may be able to help. It's important you talk to a lawyer right away to understand your options. If your case is not the best fit with us, we can help you find a great lawyer by using our national network of attorneys. Please click the link down below for a free consultation. On Wednesday, October 21st, 2009, Caribbean Petroleum Corporation, or CAPECO, began a routine transfer of more than 10 million gallons of unleaded gasoline from a tanker vessel docked two and a half miles from the facility. The only storage tank that was large enough to hold a full shipment of gasoline was already in use. As a result, Capeco planned to distribute the gasoline among four smaller storage tanks. This operation would take more than 24 hours to complete. During transfer operations, one Capeco operator was stationed at the dock, while another monitored valves controlling gasoline delivery at the terminal. At noon the next day, October 22nd, the operators diverted the gasoline into tanks 409 and 411. Capeco used a simple mechanical device consisting of a float and automatic measuring tape to determine the liquid level inside the tanks. An electronic transmitter card sent the liquid level measurements to the control room, but the transmitter card on tank 409 was out of service so operators were required to manually record the tank level readings once every hour. Okay, so the electronic transmitter was out of service. I wanna know why was it out of service? Do they have scheduled maintenance on it? Um, is this a routine thing? Additionally, I wanna know about the simple mechanical device that they used to, to 
measure the float. Um, as you can see here now, the operator's having to read this manual manually. He's reading this gauge manually. Is this gauge correct? Um, and now you're bringing in a whole other uh, potential element of error, and that is miscommunication. So there, there are a lot of things that, and, and going from the title, feeling blind, you know, I'm, I'm kind of making a little bit of assumptions of what happened. At 10 p.m. the night of the 22nd, as tank 411 reached maximum capacity, operators fully opened the valve to tank 409. At that time, an operator read the level of tank 409 from the side gauge and reported it to his supervisor. The supervisor estimated that tank 409 would be full at 1 a.m. The supervisor estimated based on a data communication that was ordered through a walkie-talkie. There, there's a lot that can go wrong. The data could be incorrect from the mechanical device. The operator could missee or could misspeak. The supervisor could mishear or just get their math wrong. This is why you need multiple data points. You need redundancies. All of this is relying on, on one data that, that, that could totally not be correct. But shortly before midnight, tank 409 started to overflow. Gasoline sprayed from the vents, forming a vapor cloud and a pool of liquid in the tank's containment dike. The CSB determined that a total of nearly 200,000 gallons of gasoline, the equivalent of 20 full tanker trucks, was released from the six vents. Wow, 200,000 gallons. Now, when you have an oil terminal like this, it is, in my mind, foreseeable that you will have some incident in which it overflows, okay? Now, because it's foreseeable, you need to have some mitigation systems in place. You need to have some technology, some systems where if it detects that an overflow is happening, everything gets shut down. Things get shut off. Just mitigation of disaster, okay? You don't let 200,000 gallons pour out. On a warm, windless night, the gasoline vapor cloud grew to cover an area of 107 acres. At midnight, the tank farm operator was ready to perform the hourly check of tank 409. But before reaching the tank, he noticed a strong odor of gasoline. He alerted the dock operator to shut off the flow of gasoline to the tank. The tank farm operator and another operator met the supervisor at the edge of the terminal. Okay, so now we're getting into more disaster mitigation. They've identified something going wrong. What is happening? The, the tank supervisor only checks every hour. Is that frequent enough for what they are doing? Um, how are they going to respond now that they've, they've, they've identified something happening? Do they make the situation worse? Do they clear the area? Do they make it safer for everybody else? Let's, let's see. Here they observed a white fog rising approximately three feet above the ground. The supervisor sent one operator to the security gate to stop anyone from entering the site. That's good. I approve of that. Then the supervisor and the tank farm operator drove to an elevated point away from the cloud to try to identify the source of the leak. Meanwhile, the pooled gasoline flowed through open valves in the containment dike toward the wastewater treatment area. There, the vapor reached electrical equipment, which ignited the cloud. A flash fire raced back toward the storage tanks. Seven seconds later. So I would want to know what this exactly is. Who owns this? Is it meant to make a spark? Of course, I'm not trying to put you know all of the blame on them, but why is it, is, if it's near an oil terminal, it's foreseeable that maybe something like this happens. Why do you have an ignition source in in the vicinity. Again, I don't I obviously don't have enough information to make that determination. I'm just saying what I would want to know. Seven seconds later, there was a massive explosion, registering 2.9 on the Richter scale. The time was 1223, approximately 26 minutes after the overflow began. Soon 17 of the facility's storage tanks were engulfed in flames.
Fortunately, the three Capeco employees escaped the tank farm, and there were no fatalities. Okay, thank goodness nobody was killed. But just because nobody was killed doesn't mean that there aren't a ton of potential other cases here. Uh, there could be personal injury cases in case people were injured, just not fatally. There could be diminished value of property claims. Obviously, this happened right next to a city with all these toxic fumes around houses, seeping into the houses, seeping into the curtains, seeping into the bed, see seeping into the roof. Nobody's going to want to buy your property over there. So if your house was worth $100,000 and now it's worth $60,000, that's called a diminished value of property claim. Additionally, there could be medical monitoring. These are toxic fumes. Somebody might be inhaling these fumes and they might not be sick today or tomorrow, but in three years, five years, you know, there, there are, there's a process called medical monitoring. They should be compensated for the medical monitoring that they are going to have to incur because they are exposed to these claims. Additionally, there are more straightforward property damage claims. What if the aftershock broke somebody's roof or foundation or windows or whatever it is? And last but not least, business interruption claims, meaning if you had a restaurant next to the oil terminal and nobody wants to go to the restaurant anymore because it is near in engulfed in the flames, you should be compensated for the business interruption you are experiencing. I did a case that actually the USCSB made a video about, I haven't reacted to it yet because it's not completely finalized, where the majority of the claims that I dealt with had to do with all these ancillary claims that aren't wrongful death related. The shockwave damaged approximately 300 nearby homes and businesses. Fires continued to burn. Yeah, see the shockwave? to the nearby homes and businesses. Remember, it's important. It's not just the property damage. It can also be the business interruption. The CSB determined that Capeco had an unreliable system for monitoring and controlling the level of gasoline inside the storage tanks. The CSB found that the float and tape measuring devices used by Capeco were prone to mechanical failure. These devices were poorly maintained and were frequently not working on multiple tanks at the same time. Okay, when you have something that's prone to fail and not working on a regular basis, you are just, again, just use the word foreseeable. Is it foreseeable? If your data points aren't working all the time, something is going to happen eventually. So the CSB discovered that lightning strikes and cable breakages often disabled the electronic transmitters that sent tank level measurements to the control. Interesting, super interesting. So now what the CSB is hinting at is there might be safer alternatives that aren't prone to these, these issues that cause the system to go down so frequently. Capeco routinely took weeks to repair problems with the level monitoring system. Instead, operators checked tank levels hourly and manually calculated the time it would take for tanks to fill potentially introducing errors. We found that the float and tape measuring system was the only control system Capeco used to avoid overfilling a tank. When that system failed, the facility did not have additional layers of protection in place to prevent an accident. Most tank filling operations are for the most part governed by a single layer which has to be backed up with other layers. The CSB notes that good engineering practice would have called for at least two additional layers of protection at Capeco. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I don't think we need to examine any more than that. Quite frankly, they just had one layer that was routinely down all the time. I think the negligence is pretty clear. There weren't any other third parties, really. Um, and thank goodness nobody was hurt. But I think the most interesting thing, point of... of claims like this, when I talk to people about these type of cases, is all the ancillary claims, because I think they are they are fascinating. Just because nobody was killed doesn't mean that there aren't still consequences. Okay, that's it for today's video. Bye.